What do Lara Datta, Eshwarya Rai and Diana Hayden have in common? Or for that matter, Dino Moria, Zulfi Saeed and Karan Kapoor? The answer is my guest. But she's not just an incredible spotter of talent, she's also the editor of a glamorous magazine, the administrator of two hospitals in Bombay, and of course, a wife and a mother. So how does she manage all these things? Well, that's just one of many questions that I'm going to put today to Maureen Wadia. Welcome to the program, Maureen. Thank you, Karen. Your Pleasure. father was a police officer and you grew up in places like Etawa and Pori Garwal. What sort of memories of childhood do you have? Happy, uh, lonely, simple, uh, golden years. But unfortunately, years when I had to go to boarding school, which wasn't very pleasant. But when I came home for holidays, um, it was lonely, couldn't find friends, and you know, invariably they were remote places. But uh, I used to go tracking with my father, or we used to go off duck shooting and things like that. And I was a very good tracker, so I was sort of always leading uh, when my father would go tracking, I mean, go duck shooting or whatever. Now, you were an only child. Were you spoilt by your parents? Contrary, never. Um, I was never ever made uh, to feel different or special and uh, I don't think one, any of us were. I mean, we were just, just normal. Now you say your parents sent you off to boarding school. One of the schools was Loreto Convent in Lucknow. When I gather the nuns wanted to make you one of their own. Well, you know, the Irish nuns um, were tough. And uh, looking back today, I have to thank them. Because what they taught me, nobody else could. And I have to say, it was quite lethal, the combination of my parents are of Irish descent, and then I land up in a convent that has Irish nuns, who were the toughest. But I have to say that um, they were fantastic. And there I was punished a lot, since they thought I was very, very vivacious, and I had personality and whatever they were looking for. And so they were keen on becoming a nun. And, um, As punishment? Uh, <laughs> No, they said that I would be, I was a good candidate to become a nun. And uh, quite frankly, at that stage, I think I may have, if my mother hadn't swooped in and said, out of this convent, and she put me into La Martinia. Not because she didn't want to be, me to become a nun, but she realized I was young and impressionable. And so I had to go to another. Now you went on school. to do a course in teacher's training, but in fact, you ended up as an air hostess with Air India. Quite a switch, wasn't it? Well, you know, my parents were very keen that I become a teacher, and uh, I went along, and I studied, and I trained, and I topped my college, and I didn't think I would, and I became a teacher. I taught for about six months, but I was just longing to travel, and in those days, traveling in India was very difficult. Was this the lure of the outside world for a small town girl? Uh, it was. I. I I realized I had to get out of this small town and I, I realized that I wanted to be in all those exotic places, not because of anything else, but because I was, I just loved to travel. So against my parents' wishes, I applied for and I got into Air India. But in fact, when you had that first interview with the legendary Bobby Cooker, things went terribly wrong, didn't they? <laughs> yes, they did. Um, I was interviewed first and um, without Bobby. And I had been accepted and put into Air India. And I, after three months of training, somebody discovered that Mr. Kuka hadn't seen Maureen Keelan. So I was hauled off uh, to his office. And I sat there waiting in trepidation. And when the door opened, the, there was this enormous office. And I expected this enormous man to be there because I'd heard so much about him. He was a tyrant. And he ran the place with an iron fist. And then, behold, there was little Bobby Cooker. And he was so charming and wonderful. And one of the characters that I will always remember, a tough man, a man of tremendous discipline. And my God, did he make Air India run and spin and fly. Now, during your time in Air India, you got to know J.R. D. Tata very well. But I gather there was an occasion when you were responsible for his flight being delayed for two hours. Yes, J.R. D. Tata. The Probably the greatest Indian that I have ever met. Humble, quiet, absolutely millenniums ahead of everyone else. And over the years, we became great friends. But our first encounter wasn't very happy 
because uh, we were at a party and uh, Jay and the tyrant Bobby Cooker, the managing director there, and they were there. And uh, they left early saying they were taking a flight to Delhi. And I was the hostess on standby for that flight. I hadn't collected my program, so when the car came to collect me in the morning for the flight, I gaily reported sick. And uh, for that, I was suspended for about 10 days. And about a week later, I was at a party, and uh, Jay Tata said to me, you know, darling, these girls nowadays are just hopeless. I mean, they really have no character. I was made to wait four hours at the airport, and this girl didn't show up. And with my head down, I had to admit, Jay, it was me. What did he say? <laughs> and um, he was fantastic. And of course, he gave me this big lecture and everything. But you know, Jay, after that, Jay became such a great friend of mine. And in fact, Jay RD ended up being my son's godfather. And my younger son, Jay, is named after Jay RD Tata. Now, of course, Erin Day opened several doors for you. You got into modeling. You became the cosmetic face of Lakme. And you had an incredible encounter once with a very famous photographer, Jahangir Gosler. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, you know, in those days, Air India, uh, so to speak, would assign us, uh, I was going to say loan, but I'd say assign us uh, for modeling. And uh, one day I got this message that I had to go and model for Lakme, and Lakme Cosmetics were just starting off in India. So I was sent off uh, just Jangir Gazda, who was a very, very famous photographer at that time. And there was little old me. And so we were doing this shot, and uh, I was supposed to just, uh, you know, look bare from up here. So I just put a towel around me. And uh, we were shooting, and then suddenly the towel fell off, you know. And now, you know, photography is a kind of thing where it's a bit like this. You're in front of somebody, and it's a little difficult. You feel a little awkward. But to suddenly be being photographed by my face, and then suddenly for my whole body. Well, you were standing stark <laughs> naked with nothing to do. It's the first time I really um, uh, understood the meaning of professionalism because I just carried on. I sort of very nonchalantly grabbed the towel, put it on, and Jango behaved as if nothing had happened. Now I carried on. It was, in fact, one of your modeling assignments that led you to meet the man you later married, Masliwade. Do you remember how that, in fact, happened? Yes, that's true. Um, but there was a friend of mine in Air India, and um, he said that there's this Nasli Wadia who wants to meet you. He's seen you somewhere. And you've never heard of him? I've never heard of him. And um, he said, do you know who he is? And I said, no, couldn't care less. I really don't want to know. I don't want to meet this person, whoever it is. If I meet him, I meet him. But I'm certainly not going to go and meet this person. But um, anyway, uh, the next thing is I got a message from Air India that I had to go and do some modeling for a company called Bombay Dying. And um, so off I went, and uh, at, um, I got this call that this person was coming to collect me to go and see the agency. And so I get this young man at my door in a white bush shirt, white slacks. And um, he says, I'm coming up, I'm taking you to the agency. And I said, okay, let's go. And you thought nothing of him whatsoever? Oh, no, I just thought he was uh, Clark in Bombay dying, or, you know, he was so simply Not dressed. the son of the chairman? No, because in those days, Nasli was working in the mills. So he just went to work every morning in a white bush shirt and a white slacks. And he'd arrange this whole thing just oh, so yes. that he could get to meet you yes. around the other way around. <laughs> yes, it was Nasli's conniving. <laughs> was it love at first sight for the two of you? Um, absolutely. Um, it went the way of most love affairs. Uh, we didn't say anything to each other, but we both knew that uh, there was chemistry. And uh, what happened was uh, we would, after the first day when I went for the assignment, and then after that I did do the photography, but uh, the next day he didn't even say it, but it was kind of taken for granted that we'd go and have a cup of tea together. And then the tea the next day went into dinner, and it progressed that way. But in fact, before you married him, you kept him waiting for a good four or five years. Were you <laughs> testing him? Were you determined to be properly wooed? Well, you know, uh, Nasli and I are both firm believers in the fact that people really shouldn't rush into marriage, and particularly marry young. And it's something that I ingrain in every young guy or girl that I meet today. But don't marry young. I mean, be sure. And I think basically what both of us were doing was really we wanted to make sure because we wanted to make this a one-time affair. 
and we didn't want this to end up in a disaster because both Nasli and I are extremely, extremely he had a reputation people. at the time, didn't he? Of being quite a playboy as well. Oh, was yes. that a cause of concern? Oh, he was a complete playboy. And uh, by then, I got to know a little about him. I mean, we'd been going out for about a year by then. And he did have this great reputation of being this playboy at large and a little red Fiat with his head stuck half the time in this car. Nasli is very mechanical. And, uh, but he was a playboy. And, um, I was a little, um, and I was a little afraid of this because I thought maybe I can't handle this guy. But by 1970, you were no longer scared, and you were ready to take the plunge. And yet, then you discovered that Nasli really didn't have that much money to buy you the diamond ring you dreamt of. Well, you know, Karen, money never mattered, but we didn't have any money, uh, and we managed on what we had, and we were very happy. In fact, in those days, I was earning more than him. What did he do? What did he give you as an engagement present? Was it in fact a diamond? <laughs> well, um, we didn't have any money, so we waited a little while, and uh, Nasli's parents and mine said, you know, you've got to stand on your own two feet. So, you know, whatever you're going so to do. So he promised to ring after he married you? Uh, and no. you first, you get the ring later. <laughs> no. Uh, we waited, and uh, we collected a grand amount of 17,000 rupees in the year 1970. And uh, we bought a diamond off a very dear friend of ours, the Pitambas, who I lived with for a few years. They were like my surrogate parents and uh, in Bombay. And uh, so we used that ring as the engagement ring. So Nasli paid a vast amount of 17,000 for this beautiful ring. And then I gather when you got married, he took you on quite a unique honeymoon. <laughs> He apparently spent a lot of his time checking and counting <laughs> the cash gifts he received. That's true. Well, you know, I must say Parsis, and my husband is a Parsi, are, I think, very clever that uh, when they give you wedding gifts, they don't give you silver or china, things like that. You're so, thinking like money, though. Yes, they give you little envelopes of money. So anyway, we had no money to go anywhere exotic. And frankly, the idea of going somewhere exotic never occurred to us. And uh, Sunil Pranpit said, take our Juhu shack and go there for your honeymoon, and we were delighted. And so we drove off. We get to this house, and I say, well, I think you're going to carry me over the threshold. And Nasli says, are you kidding? You're too heavy. And I said, well, I'm not heavy, <laughs> but you're going to carry me over that threshold. So he does, staggers across the room, throws me on the bed, and I say, wow, I mean, this is wonderful. And he says, now, take out all the money. Take out all the envelopes. Let's count how much money we've made. And I said, you're kidding. He said, no, 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 come on. And so we sat there cross-legged on the bed like two banyas and like two merchants. We counted all our money and we made quite a lot. We were pleased as punch. And we had our two bottles of champagne. We had our little weekend there. And we were so happy. Well, I'm not going to say that it all ended happily ever after that point because actually that was the beginning of a whole new life and a whole new career for you. So let's take a break and come back and I want to find out about all the wonderful things you've done since you became Mrs. Nasliwadia. We'll be back in just a couple of moments. Stay with us. Welcome back. My guest is Maureen Wadia. Maureen, shortly after you got married, you took over control of the advertising at Bombay Dying and in the process you launched Karan Kapoor as the face of the company. Today, everyone says it was a brilliant choice, but at the time, you got quite a lot of flack for it, didn't you? A tremendous amount of flack. Uh, Karen, I have one failing. One is that I like to bend and break rules. And uh, the other was that uh, I thought Karen was a true representative of India, a Raj Kapoor nephew. Uh, yes, blonde hair, blue eyes, and everything. But uh, I wanted that particular look. And uh, Karen was an absolute astonishing success. And at that stage, most people thought that I was crazy. But um, as they say, imitation is the best form of flattery. And uh, I was imitated by so many advertising companies after that. And uh, I think Karen, today, if you see Karen, uh, you will only think of Bombay dying because uh, it was, he was just Bombay dying. And, you know, it was, he was a fantastic model. Now, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, the publisher R.V. Pandit came into your life and suggested that you should become the editor of his new magazine, Glad Rags, and you laughed at him. A year later, you were doing the job. What made you change your mind? 
Well, Pandit Beata Rajini started this magazine called Glad Rags, and um, she uh, had to move to Bangalore because she wanted to move there with her new husband and their baby. So Pandit said to me that, would you take over Glad Rags? And I said, certainly not. And uh, I said, there are two things I'll do. I'll change the names if I do, and I'll do it for one month. And thirdly, you and I will not see each other because I'm a very tempestuous person and we will fight. And he said, please do whatever you like and I'll stay out of the way. I said, okay. And after a couple of months, the bug bit. And unwittingly, I soon became the editor and I took over the magazine. And um, I have never, ever had anything as challenging because it was nine and a half years ago and uh, the going was tough. It's a very glamorous magazine, but it's also quite a controversial one, particularly with some of your own friends. How would you describe Glad Rags? Well, when I started Glad Rags almost 10 years ago, there were only three magazines and political magazines. And I thought I have to go right between, and I did. I, I wanted to do a magazine that was very glamorous. I wanted to break a lot of old taboos because I believe that we are a nation steeped in tremendous amount of hypocrisy and old sort of fuddy-duddy ideas, which I wanted to get. So Glad Rags is a deliberate kick in the conventional teeth of those yes. who can't think modern. Absolutely. I mean, this is it. You're being a rebel. I've always been a rebel. And, uh, uh, well, everybody's been imitating me ever after. So Glad Rags have also intended right. to shock you. Uh, yes, because uh, I began, and I still am, very small. You're looking at a one-woman show. And uh, in order to, to get into the market, I had to get way between. So I didn't want to go political. I didn't want to go filmy. So what I did was I took a center part, yes, which I have always rocked the boat, and I believe that I always will. Now how did all this lead to the fabulous manhunt and mega model competitions that you've been launching for the last seven years? I have always believed that you have to be a trendsetter. And uh, I wanted... Uh, basically, the Glad Rags Mega Model and Manhunt Contest are contests where we search for and bring out fresh talent, good-looking talent. And uh, when I started the contest, the whole idea was that we would find these new faces, new good-looking, aspiring male and female models, and we would give them a platform to launch themselves. So that was basically the intention. And it has been so successful, and the mega model and the manhunt today uh, have been controversial, and uh, they're glamorous events. But they've been really successful, because if you just look at the list of winners, Aishwarya Rai, Diana Hayden, Lara Tata, Dino Maria, Zulfi Said, I mean, have you a talent for spotting talent? <laughs> Obviously, I think somewhere uh, most of us have a talent. And I think uh, from the time that I started, when I really chose Karan Kapoor as the Bombay Dying model, and he lasted for a good 15 years, from that time onwards, I obviously unwittingly realized that I had a talent uh, for spying and finding other talent. You can actually pick one when you see one. Yes, I, I have an evil eye. I know. I know when I look at someone, just as you would in your own field, uh, or anybody in their field, that I can spot a winner a mile off. Whether Do these people then carry a Maureen Wadia stamp on them for the rest <laughs> of their lives? They say they do, and uh, they say I'm a one-woman finishing school, and by the time I finish with them, I've taught them about wines, I've taught them how to talk, how to dress, how to conduct themselves, how to model, how to walk, and most of all, and, and this is what I'm, I'm really proud of, is the fact that I motivate them into careers. Not just careers where they're going to just spend their whole life looking into a mirror and saying, I'm going to be a model. And I make them search, so search. I take them around the world. I take them to Milano. I take them to Paris. I take them to New York. I send them for contests to 37 countries. I send them all over. They participate in contests. And it gives them tremendous self-confidence, travel improves the mind. And it's not just these people that you actually create. You also spend a lot of time running two hospitals in Bombay, and that's not glamour and model at all. That's hard work, isn't it? 
Well, you know, this is one country that uh, really needs charity. And I have to say that Nasli's forefathers, 70 years ago, built these two hospitals, the Wadia Children's Hospital and the Wadia Women's Hospital. So those are the two Pirel. Yes. They are in, in the middle of industrial Bombay and Pirel, totally free to any caste, creed, and denomination. And um, unfortunately, when my father-in-law passed away four years ago, I took over in his place at the hospitals. Big pair of shoes to fill. And um, I have been, uh, I think I've been quite good at what I've been doing, even though I say it myself. Tell me something. I look at the list of things you do, and I say to myself, is she a workaholic? Yes, <laughs> she is. And is she driven? <laughs> I am absolutely driven. I am a perfectionist and I have the tenacity of a crab. I will never let go and I work so hard and uh, I don't say that because I want people to think I work hard. I enjoy what I do. Work is more rewarding. Work is my worship and at the moment the two hospitals what I'm doing there has been the most fulfilling work that I have ever done in my Even life. Even more than the mega models in the man. Oh, has. much more, much more, because this is one country that needs all the help it can get. So at the end of the day, when your head touches the pillow, what is it that gives you a sense of satisfaction that you've achieved something or that you've contributed meaningfully? I think that I have done what I was put on this earth for. I have no idea what that was for. but. If I can change and help anybody else's life, I'm very, very honored to do that. And is that how you'd like to be remembered? Noreen Raja was the person that helped me realize myself? If someone remembers me that way, I'd be very flattered. But I would like to be remembered as somebody who came into this life, came into this world, and made a difference. Not a little difference, but a big difference. That's important. That's important. For Noreen Raja, thank you. For a wonderful interview, which has certainly made a difference. Thank you very Thank much you indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Thank you.